Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth Quincentennial Lecture Series brought to you by the National Quincentennial Committee in partnership with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Presidential Communications Operations Office, Radio Television Malacanang, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, Department of Foreign Affairs, and the Department of Education. This series has been halted for a time in February of 2020 because of the pandemic. This is the physical lecture being conducted by the Quincentennial Committee since 2018. And during the pandemic, we converted this into a countdown to 500 online lecture series. So beginning today, we are um, restoring it to have a physical lecture beginning here in Giwan. And then the next lecture will be in Iloilo City. I think this is on uh, March 26, if I am right. So, and then we will continue this until 2022, this physical lecture. But this lecture, even though it is physical, we will still abide by the IATF rules. So, on behalf of the National Quincentennial Committee, I am extending my, our gratitude to the host municipality, Giwan. And we have here Mayor Annalisa Kwan. And also, we are, all, uh, we are extending the same to Ambassador of Spain in the Philippines, Jorge Muraga Sanchez. Thank you very much for attending. And yeah, thank you very much. And our lecturer for this afternoon is actually our lecturer, supposedly, in the sixth lecture series is scheduled on March 14, 2020, actually. So we're just continuing the, uh, the lecture affected by the pandemic. So let me read his uh, brief bio, uh, bio note. Our lecturer for this afternoon is a public historian whose area of specialization is the 19th century Philippines, its art, culture, and the heroes who figure in the emergence of the Filipino nation. He is a professor and former chairperson of the Department of History of the Ateneo de Manila University. He has also served as the president of the Philippine Historical Association, chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and chairperson of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. He has published over 30 books, writes an editorial page column in the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and moderates growing Facebook and Instagram pages. Ladies and gentlemen, let me call on Professor Ambet R. Ocampo. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, the lecture is very simple. <clears throat> there are actually more historians who know the story better than I do, Danny Herona, who is the expert on Magellan, and uh, Dr. Borinaga here, who is the expert on the history of Eastern Samar. So I want to talk today on more general terms, because this is the beginning of the, the, the real celebration, to talk about how we should frame history and how we should frame the past. So the talk will be about the Philippines, Magellan, within 500 years. Um, it, it upset me a bit yesterday to watch the, the Pope from the Vatican uh, preside over a Mass to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Christianity, simply because I was half hoping that the Church would not, um, would not take over the celebrations, but they already started. And I think that uh, just like most history, just today, listening to the questions from the media about controversy, history is about viewpoint. And history is not as simple as we learned in school. And so even when we, we commemorate the arrival of Christianity in the Philippines, it's important to see that it was double-edged in the same way that the arrival of Magellan was double-edged. In the responsorial psalm yesterday, there was a line that said, let my tongue be silenced if I ever forget you. And while the text refers to Jerusalem and the Old Testament Jews, those words are relevant for Filipinos today that commemorate, not celebrate, 
the week of the arrival of Ferdinand Magellan. So let our tongues be silenced if we forget what this is all about. So what is important here is not so much the remembering of the story. It is 500 years, but the questions I want to bring out this afternoon will be, how do we remember? What do we remember? And most importantly, how Filipinos should remember the past. In my talk today, I will just make three points. I will talk about maps and national identity. And then I will talk about indigenization or how we have made the foreign into our own, the foreign made local. And I will conclude by asking us to go over and look back to see the challenge of history. Now, uh, when I write my history book, the first line will be about the Philippines being a young nation with an old history. We are young because we were only, depends on where you count Independence Day, it can be 1898, June 12, or it can be July 4, 1946. But what we often forget is that history is about written record. And if we are to go beyond the written record, we actually have an old prehistory, a history even before Magellan arrived. We go back 67,000 years if we go by archaeological findings. Now, when I was in college, I found out about maps because one of my friends was a great collector of maps. And at the time, this was in 30, 40 years ago, I was studying French. And so this friend of mine said, why don't you translate the text that is in this 18th century map of the Philippines? So the top of the map talked about who made the map, why the map was made, etc. And then in the lower part, there was a history of the map that started with Magellan and talks about how the Philippines developed under Spain. Now, when you look at it, because we have Google Earth, maps like this are irrelevant to us. Uh, they're old-fashioned, but they actually are quite charming. But reading this map was not so much a lesson in French. It showed me that the history of the Philippines is complicated, to take a Facebook term. And part of that complicated story, we can actually see through old maps. The 18th century map that I used in that early French exercise was based on the great Murillo Velarde map, which is supposed to be the mother of Philippine maps because as early as 1734, they already had the general shape of the Philippines as we know it today. And when you think about it, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have satellite imagery, and yet they were able to, to draw in 1734 the Philippines very much as we know it today. But that's not it. What was important was to review what I was taught in school. School taught me to see division in maps. When we study maps in school, we talk about different countries, capital cities, different languages. It taught me to see division, but it did not teach me to see connections. So like when you look at the picture, this is what our people, our students study in Hekasi or civics. They talk about the ASEAN member countries. You'll study uh, the different places on the map. You will study different flags. You will study types of government. When you, will, you forget to realize that before Europe came to Southeast Asia, this whole place called Insular Southeast Asia was sort of one. They were separate, but it was only when Europe came and carved it out that it became ASEAN as we know it today. So when they talk about um, Magellan and colonization, you have to remember that the Philippines was born out of a colonial experience. We would not be where we are without that colonial experience. So it is high time that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We take everything that came from the past, both the good and the bad, in order to see where we are, where we came from, and where we are going. In school, I was taught that the Philippines is an archipelago, a group of islands that is separated by water. But when I looked at the Murillo Velarde map, 
It was not just a map of land. It was a hydrographic map. So it showed you waterways and where the, all these waterways actually connected the islands. So I realized that the history I, taught, I was taught was wrong because the Philippines is not a group of islands separated by water. The Philippines is a group of islands that is connected by water. Um, Nick Joaquin uh, tells us that Spain brought us the wheel. Spain brought us land, roads and bridges because they were an inland people. But before the Spanish came, in order to go from one bank to the other, either you swam or you took a boat. So the, the waterway was not an impediment. The waterway was actually a connection. So when you look at it, it shows you that a lot of what we learned in school, we really have to relearn. Now, in school we are taught how many islands are there in the Philippines. And as you know, in 1994, uh, Charlene Gonzalez, the Miss Universe contestant, was asked how many islands are there in the Philippines. And she did not know the exact number. So when she was asked how many islands are there in the Philippines, her answer was high, light, high tide or low tide. And everyone laughed. No, and uh, this, this gave her 10 seconds to think. And then her answer was 7,107 high tide, 7,108 low tide. When I was growing up, the magic number was 7,107. Now, later when I left school, I asked myself, what is the source for 7,107? This is a screenshot from the Department of Tourism's um, tourism program. And even here, they still say 7,107. Now, I asked, when I was chair of the Historical Commission, I said, we should rewrite the textbooks and give a correct number. So I asked the National Coast and Geodetic Survey and the National Mapping Center, how many islands are there in the Philippines? And their answer was, high tide or low tide. So I told them, give me a high tide number and give me a low tide number, and they could not supply it. So I said, give me the source for 7,107, and they could not answer again. So in order to trap them, and this is what you do, the mayor knows that there is a little known civil service rule that says, if you write to any government official, that government official has to respond in writing within 15 days or you will be brought to Sandigan Bayan. So what I did was I left a note on the Namria website saying how many islands are there in the Philippines. Of course, they did not answer. And then I wrote in the inquirer, I left a note in Namria website and they did not reply. So the next day they answered. And they said the source for 7,107 is a 1941 U.S. Geodetic Coast Survey. And I said, 1941? That's the beginning of the Japanese occupation. We're already in 2021, and you still don't know, well, around 1980. And so I found out. Where did they get it? They got it from an American period Philippine geography textbook, which was published in 1902. And this textbook was used for a whole generation up to 1959. So from 1918 to 1959, almost 50 years in use, the only thing that changed was the cover, but not the content. And that is where you got 7,107. But there is an old map of the Philippines, Munster, 1540. And I like old maps because you have all sorts of things. There's sea monsters, mermaids, etc. And this shows you Asia. And when you look at it, on the upper right, you will see, this is 1540, they have an archipelago of 7,448 islands already. Where did they get that? I'm sure they just invented it. But at least they had more numbers than we did. Now, fortunately, Namria has now given us the correct number. According to Namria, it is now 7,641 islands. So we have 534 new islands. But unfortunately, 
when you ask them what is the number, 7,641 does not include rocks. And when you ask yourself, why will we include rocks in the number? Because the United Nations Law of the Sea defines rocks as a landform above water during high tide that is more than 2,000 square meters, meaning you can build two, three houses on it. So those are rocks. So our 7,641 islands has over 1,000 rocks, which are not listed and are not named. So again, what number should we get? That is a big question. Now, the thing here is that we ask ourselves if technology has made it incomplete. Uh, you open Google Maps, you can see like today, uh, Mr. Galvan was following our route from Tacloban to Giwan, so we could see on the Google map that we are really on the tip of uh, summer, which was quite interesting. So you ask yourself, what do we need paper maps for? But the charm of old maps is that not only are they pretty, but they actually give us the state of knowledge. What was knowledge like at the time? And so a map like this, 1619, is very interesting because it shows us here a Spanish and a Dutch ship that are fighting. And then you see the general shape of the Philippines at, as it is being formed. My small collection of old maps, I concentrated on 16th, 17th century maps because I want to see, well, more than looking at the uh, whale and the sea monster here. But when you look at the shape of the Philippines, it's not yet complete. So depending on their knowledge, the, the, the shape of the Philippines starts to grow and become what we know of it today. Again, it's the sea monsters that I really like. But this actually shows you what it was like in the 16th century when Magellan traveled. Today, as we came in to Katakloban, I looked at the islands and I said, you have to be able to imagine what Magellan went through in the 16th century. Today, we, fl we fly by air. We see land and we see islands. But in the 16th century, Magellan's voyage was like going into outer space. Nobody knew what was there. To go beyond uh, Gibraltar, what was there? To go beyond the, the, the pillars of Hercules, what was there? It was unknown territory. So more than exploration, it was, it was bravery to go into a place that was unknown. And maps actually trace that discovery, trace the drawing of the earth, which we call geo, which is land, and graphia, which is writing. The earliest map of the Philippines that is separate, made around 1598, and it shows you the configuration of the Philippines is not as we know it today, which is top to the bottom. This one, the Philippines, is lying down. And my students used to say, ah, because maybe the boat was passing that way. I said, no, it's just the way that we have configured islands. But you can see from these early maps how it is, this one, it's the other way around. Luzon is here, Mindanao is there. Cebu's already there, no? uh, and you can see slowly how they are putting these things together. Uh, this one, 1598, you see the Philippines, Luzon is very big, then you have Mindanao here, Mindanao's over here, but you can see the general shape is already taking place. The maps can also be read as outlines of trade and evangelization and empire. When you look at maps, they tell us not only what things are there, but also the countries that are related to it. So when you look at old maps, uh, this French map from 1600, and in 2019, when Dr. Escalante and I went to Lisbon, they opened it up, showed us this nice map of 1643. The Filipino historians only know the Spanish sources, and not so well but we don't know the Portuguese sources. So we have a very hardworking ambassador in Lisbon who has been making the academic exchange very, very fruitful. So you see here, Filipinas, uh, it's hand-drawn, and uh, you can see even the 
the names uh, in the Ilocos, Boheador, Bigan, Sidayao, Ilocos, Luna, they're all already there. When I looked at this, I realized that it actually mirrors a 17th century map, which is called the Selden map, which was made by a Chinese artisan. And uh, we, this was on display in Singapore. I wish they had brought it here. I had flown to Singapore because I didn't want to fly all the way to Oxford to look at it. But there was nobody there, only me. So I had the whole hour to run my cell phone through the, through the display case while there was no one looking um, in order to take a picture of the map. And when you see that, you will see that the Chinese who made it, they gave the place names, and you already see it in the 17th century. Apari, Pagudput, Burgos, Lawag, Manila, Maguindanao, Oton, and they gave the Chinese characters. So you see here the root of trade. Now we will look at evangelization, because it's the 500th anniversary. This is the frontispiece of a book called The Conquest of the Philippine Islands, by Gaspar de San Agustin. It's a very beautiful drawing which shows you San Agustin here on the left and behind him is Andres Urdaneta who was the navigator of the expedition. Then you have Philip II here and behind him is Legaspi. Because we always think of Magellan but the real start of the Spanish period is really Urdaneta and Legaspi. So they're looking up the name of Jesus there, sending the divine race down to earth, and the race go down to a group of islands. And you see Philip II pointing to the islands which now bear his name, Filipinas. So he's pointing down, see Philip II. So it's interesting to see also how empire and the church came. But in Philip's time, it was literally the empire where the sun never set. So, in old books, which most people do not read anymore, at least you can look at the pictures, you can see how the Spanish kings would show two globes to show the old world and the new. What Magellan and the other explorers made available to them. So, old maps can be read in other ways. This is a map that is only in the British Library. I'm sorry the picture does not come out very well. Engraved in the 18th century by Nicolas de la Cruz Bagay. Uh, there is a map of the world. And when you look at the map of the world, this is what the world looks like. Sorry, it's not very good, but in the second map, they did a symbolic aspect of the Hispanic world. So the world is drawn, and in it you have a beautiful woman who is Hispania. So I saw the actual map in 2019. It's bigger than I thought it actually was. And when you look very, very closely at this map, it will show you Hispania, again looking up to God, and she's holding the flag here you know, with the coat of arms of Spain. And this flagpole is actually the dividing line where the Pope, we don't know what gave him that authority, he cut the world in half like an orange and gave half of the known, unknown world to Portugal, the other half to Spain. If you look at this map, uh, you will see on her crown are all the provinces of Spain. So you will have Galicia, Luzon, Tole uh, Leon, Toledo, Cordoba, it's all in her crown. And you see in the bottom it says España. And then her diadem in the middle is actually all, it's northeast, west, south, and then these are the treasure ships. So her, her jewels were the voyages of exploration and the trading things that they brought home. The most wonderful part of this map is that the cloak of Hispania is actually South America. So it's drawn there, she's drawn very, very nicely, and then her shapely, beautiful legs are actually the roots that went from Mexico to the Philippines and back. And in the very bottom, her chinelas, her shoes, are the Philippines. So the right shoe is Luzon, and the left shoe is Mindanao. Uh, so it shows you the symbolic aspect of what it is like 
how the personification of España has the whole of America on her cloak and the Philippines as her chinelas. In the beginning, people would see this and say, Ay, why are we the chinelas? But some more nationalistic people say, if you don't have the chinelas, then you cannot stand up. No? So she's actually standing up on the farthest part of the empire. The other thing you should see is that this is Spain, colonial Spain in 1852. We only think of the Philippines. But most people don't know that the Caroline Islands, the Marianas, Guam, was part of the Philippines, and they were actually uh, administered from Cebu. So there is a map that many of my friends, when they're in flea markets, they're so excited because they get this map. It says in French, the map of the new Philippines. And then they said, doesn't look like the Philippines. And I said, because that's not the Philippines. That's the Marianas and Guam and the Caroline Islands. But what people do not realize is that the, the Spanish maps included not only the Philippines, but so much more that we don't know about in our textbook. The last beautiful Spanish map ever made is in a house in Forbes Park. It was made by the city of Manila and given to the widow of a assassinated Spanish premier by the city of Manila. It's made of silver and gold. And then the, the writing, like this archipelago Filipino, those are emeralds. And then the major island points are red, are in rubies. This was acquired in, a, in an auction in New York in the 1980s for 25,000 US dollars. It, when it was made in 1899, it already cost 25,000 US dollars. So when it was bought, they, they didn't even know what it was. But you will see here, the decorations are anahao, which are Philippine things. It's the most beautiful map, but unfortunately, it is in a private collection. Then came the end of the Spanish Empire. You know who this old man is. This is Uncle Sam, who was studying another map and looking at the Philippines. Uh, so this is 1898, uh, McKinley, Uncle Sam, they're looking at maps and looking, it, looking at it like pieces of meat that they could divide. So this is Uncle Sam and John Bull, the British and the Americans dividing the world. And when you think about it, in 1899, this was the American empire. The span of the American eagle went all the way from the Ladrones, the Philippines, all the way to Puerto Rico. What the former Spanish Empire was, was taken over by another one. So what we see here is not only history, but we also see how maps can include and maps can exclude. Uh, when I was living for a few months in Indonesia, I realized that their biggest banknote had a map of Indonesia. But it was kind of strange because in their, in their money, there was a diplomatic protest because when, the Indo when Indonesia printed this, they had actually printed part of Malaysia and part of Papua New Guinea in their money. So they complained and said, why is your money there? And they said, no, because that used to be part of Indonesia. Now, we had a similar problem. Uh, as chairman of the historical commission, I sat in the Banco Central Numismatic Committee. And when we were designing the banknotes that you have in your, in your wallets today, there was a lot of, of comment because I wanted to change the banknotes. But nobody listens to me. So I said, why are all the banknotes horizontal? Why don't we have them vertical? And they said, what do you want, Dr. Acampo? I said, let's put the head at the tip of the bill so that when you put it in the vending mach machine, Quezon's head will go in first. No? Uh, and then they said, no, we have to... We have to recalibrate all the machines. I said, they recalibrate all the machines. They, they did not listen to me. But what was interesting was I wanted to do the Philippine banknotes like a jigsaw puzzle. We have 20, 50, 100, 200, 500, 1,000. And I said, we will put parts of the map of the Philippines on each note so that when you put all of them together, you will have a map of the Philippines. And... Uh, they did not listen to me. But they put in the map in the 1,000 bill. I'm sorry it doesn't come out very well here. But when you look at it, 
the map of the Philippines, I'm sorry, it doesn't come out. There's a small map of the Philippines here. And when the money came out, we were called to a congressional hearing because I think the congressmen in places which were not in the map complained and said, our island is not in the map. And we said, it's so small, how can you put it there? Uh, and fortunately, then President Aquino, when he heard of it, he said, if I get lost, I will look for a real map. I will not open my, you know, and look at my money. So that killed the, the case. But if you will remember your history, maps are important to Carlos P. Romulo, who was foreign secretary, one of the people who signed the United Nations Charter. You will probably know that when the UN seal was being designed by the Americans, of course, they put America in the very center of the emblem. And the reason was because you are in New York, which is in America, we are the center of the universe. So when Romulo saw it, he said, where is the Philippines there? And they said, General Romulo, the Philippines isn't there. And then he said, why isn't it there? Because it's so small. And if you insist on putting it, it will be only a dot. And Romulo is quoted to have said, I want the damn dot. So they put it in, and that's why the Philippines is represented by a dot. Now, maps also tell us about disputed territory. This is quite controversial. As you know, Japan and Korea have been fighting over a body of water, which all the maps call the Sea of Japan. But the Koreans want to remove the Japan, and they call it the East Sea. So in a similar way, all the maps call it the South China Sea, but we have unilaterally called it the West Philippine Sea. Now, this is retired Justice Antonio Carpio. It was one of the big regrets of my life that DFA once offered to send. They said, Dr. Ocampo, we will send you all around the world for six months. And I said, what for? They said, we want you to dig up all of the old maps of the Philippines, and we wa you want you to show the disputed territory. And I said, you know the Chinese? I'm sure they have old maps. And if they don't have it, they will invent it. So don't waste our time. But Mr. Justice Carpio actually looked at all the old maps. And he found in the 1734 Murillo Velarde map, he found what was called Las Bajos de Paragua, which is the disputed Spratly or Kalayaan Islands. And then if you look very close at Luzon, you will see these three things. There are shoals. Scarborough Shoal is called Panatag to us. It's called Democracy Reef. But in 1734, it was called Panakot. Panakot means threat. If you will look up here, the other island, the other reef is called Galit. And the other one in the bottom is called Lumbay. So if you look at the Tagalog terms, these three things mean anger, threat, and sorrow, which are terms because if the, if the ship captain doesn't know, you will either get a threat, a threat, or sorrow. So it shows you that. And these are within the map. Of course, the Chinese say, but that was a Spanish map. It's not a Philippine map. But it has not appeared in any Chinese map till today. So I think the Chinese are still inventing a map older than ours to show their territory. So today, we end this part and talk about maps as representations of nation. This used to be very, very popular, a map of the Philippines on your t-shirt. You literally wear the shape of the country on your sleeve. And that shows you how we have come to identify the physical shape of the Philippines as part of our identity and part of our nationality. Now, the NHCP has given us the Philippine route of the map. Now we will go into Magellan. In 2019, uh, the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon arranged for five Philippine historians to give a talk in the so uh, Geographic Society of Lisbon. And the title was just very clever. It was just the three forms of Magellan's name. 
Magalhães, the, the Portuguese name, Magalhães, the Spanish name, and Magellan, which is the English name. And when you see this, it was just names. But it goes beyond the names because it shows you not only a difference in the naming, but also in the way in which each country thinks about Magellan and remembers him. So, how do we remember Magellan today? Uh, we pass through it on the air today. In Sorsogon, there's a place called Magallanes. In Cavite, there's also a place called Magallanes. And in Agusan, there's another place called Magallanes. In Metro Manila, where the ambassador and I live, there is what is called the Magallanes Interchange. There's Magallanes Village, Magallanes Church, and Magallanes uh, Shopping Center. When you look at Magallanes Village, which is an Ayala property, the late, the late Fernando Sobel, not the young one who's running it today, but his great-grand-uncle, designed all the Makati villages. And when you look at Magallanes Villages, it has Victoria, Trinidad, San Antonio, Santiago Streets, which are the names of the ships of the Magellan Expedition. There is, of course, which we are uh, commemorating this week, there's Homonhon and there's Limasawa, which is also part of the Magellan Expedition. And then, of course, the main street is called Magallanes, and the other one is Lapu-Lapu, and you also have a Humabon Street. So in this village, you have a memory of the Magellan Expedition, but people do not remember. You ask the people who live there, they don't know who these people are. No? So uh, it is a challenge for the mayor here when we give them a historical marker, how to make the people who live there actually appreciate and remember it. Magallanes used to be a monument erected in Manila in 1845, 48, and it gave rise to the Paseo de Magallanes, the place where people would walk around. It was destroyed in 1945, and maybe the ambassador should correct this and have it rebuilt because what was put up in its place was the 400th anniversary of Mexico-Philippines expedition instead of the Spanish-Philippines expedition. And your colleague from Mexico has been going around Intramuros checking this to prepare for his own celebration. We also have in Cebu the Cross of Magellan, which many people claim grows two inches a year. That's not true. Uh, they used to tell me that the reason why the, the, the roof was there because the, the cross grows and is almost hitting the roof. I said, if you calculate 1521 to 2021, it would have gone beyond the roof. No? But again, I don't tell that to the people of Cebu because they might not allow me in anymore. Um, we, there was also a big problem over, is this the real Magellan's cross? Everyone knows after the Battle of Mactan, they probably made it into firewood. No? Um, but then there used to be a sign here that there was one sign that said this is the real cross. Then there's another sign that says, no, there is a small part of the real cross that is inside this one. So again, we don't know. Anyway, the Basilica of the Santo Nino is the oldest Christian church in the Philippines. And inside it, of course, is the Santo Nino. But what most people do not remember is that while the Santo Nino is considered the oldest Christian relic, there are two other things that are in, con in, in contention. The Virgin of Guadalupe and the Eche Homo. When the wife of Humabon was baptized, she was given a present. They offered her the Christ. She didn't like it. She offered her the Virgin Mary. She didn't like it. But this one she liked kasi, diba? it looks like a doll. Cute, diba? So he got this. she got this one. So there are three others, but the other two are still debatable. In the Louvre Museum in Paris, they have found a Santo Nino who is the cousin of ours, made in, in Flemish style. This is what it looks like, but because Filipinos have something about nudity, we have never seen our Nino naked. No? Uh, so this is what he looks like, but I think it is the same. Over the years, I've looked at pictures this is the pre-war picture of the Nino. He's black. And then, around 1970, they gave him glutathione, so he became white. And then now he's brown. No? Uh, 
So I don't know how they're doing this. No? So you have overcooked, undercooked, and this one is just right. So um, <laughs> that's how we should think about the Santonina. Anyway, we'll find out when we go to Cebu. Then we also have the Sinulog, where people go dance, beautiful lady with the, with the Santo Nino. We also have Ati Atihan. So it's always a beautiful girl dancing with the Santo Nino. But what's more important is the Santo Nino, just like biblical text, is made in our image and likeness. The Santo Nino can wear a barong Tagalog. And depending on your work, you can have a Santo Nino chef, you can have a Santo Nino medic, you can have a Santo Nino policeman, uh, you can have a chemist on the left and a judge on the right. And this one's really strange. There's a Santo Nino Santa Claus no, that comes out in Christmas. Uh, we even have a Santo Nino vendor who sells cigarettes. And the nicest one is this one. It's the Santo Nino of Jollibee. So he holds a burger in his hand. And most people will find this very sacrilegious, but what you see here is indigenization. It is making the foreign local, turning something foreign into our own. And it's the Iglesia Filipina Independiente or the Aglipayans that first did it. They had the virgin of Balintawak, and the Nino is dressed in Katipunan uniform. No, uh, This is what it looks like now in their um, cathedral in Manila. And this one, I'm going to give to our Spanish consul who is leaving uh, in a few months. I always give it to departing diplomats. I get a fresh supply in Quiapo. This is the Santo Nino with an erect penis. No, uh, So it's used for good luck, fertility, etc. cetera. No? Uh, and most people get very, very shocked by this. But this is, again, how the foreign was indigenized and made Filipino. So that's one of the things I want you to think about. Finally, we go to the battle. In the Museum of the Augustinians in Valladolid, two years ago, I saw this wooden Molave plaque, which was, mar they marked the Battle of Mactan in 1843, a certain Benito Perez, said this is where, after interviewing people, this is where the battle happened. And so, after 1853, the Spanish built a monument in 1866, made of coral, and you will see here to, to Ferdinand Magellan, a Hernando Magallanes, and Glorias Españolas. It is about the Spanish glories. 2021, what the National Quincentennial Commission, we are now building a Filipino memorial to victory and to humanity. And we base this on Lapu-Lapu, but our problem with Lapu-Lapu is that there is very little or no documentation on him, and that's why what we don't know, we have filled up with our imagination. In the Picafeta text in Yale University, you will see that there's a talk about Mactan, etc., and Zula, but you will see the name there is C. Lapu-Lapu, because the C is supposed to be the honorific. Um, it's always C. Lapu-Lapu, not just Lapu-Lapu. No? So when you look at it, what is the real name? Because in, if you look at the Declaration of Independence of the Philippines, in the Declaration of Independence 1898, they didn't use Lapu-Lapu, they used Kalipulaco. So it depends, I guess, what they are thinking of. And then we have statues of um, Lapu-Lapu. This was set up by Richard Gordon in between the National Museum. I call it Conan the Barbarian. And uh, I wanted to have him removed. But my students claim, and I've never checked this, they go and look. They say, you look under the loincloth and you will see that he is well endowed. I said, I don't care to look under, no, but that's what they see. If you go to Mactan for many years, this was the image of Lapu-Lapu. He's always beautiful black hair, toned. He goes to the gym, no? so he has nice gym-toned body, and he's always angry. No? Uh, he's always fighting, so he's in comics. Um, there's a whole comic story about his love life, 
Lamberto Avellana made a film in 1956, which was called Lapu Lapu. No? And then uh, the latest one was our Senator Lito Lapid, who played Lapu Lapu. No? Uh, that's another one. And Lapu Lapu is always shown as a beautiful, toned, muscular man. So in wrestling, uh, this was one guy who put Lapu Lapu as a tattoo behind him. And this is the funniest. A few years ago, Lapu Lapu was made the image model for diapers. Uh, so there's a Lapu Lapu and his wife and a happy baby, and they sold Lapu Lapu EQ diapers. No? Now, uh, Danny Herona claims that Lapu Lapu was 70 years old, but the text tells us he was old, meaning we are now changing the image, this is the National Quincentennial image, and this is the new 5,000 peso bill. He's older than we want him to be. Um, so again, that makes us wonder, was Lapu-Lapu in the water when the Mactan battle happened? Seems he was not there. But again, the victory goes to the leader. Our president actually complained at the beginning of the Quincentennial, saying that why are we emphasizing Magellan instead of Lapu-Lapu. And President Duterte said rather rightly that the Lapu-Lapu was the first Filipino to kill a foreigner, but we have made him into a fish. Uh, so according to the President, it pains me deeply to see Lapu-Lapu being eaten every day. Escabeche, fried, and all sorts of recipe. Now, this is a story that is quite funny because in 1998, we were supposed to build a theme park in Clark. And the proposal was to have a reenactment of the Battle of Mactan, complete with laser swords. No, it's simulated. And I approved it because I said, can you imagine, for 50 pesos, you can hack Magellan to death. So I said, 500 years of pent-up anti-colonial uh, feeling we can let make money and we can kill Magellan. Unfortunately, it did not push through because the Spanish ambassador came and said, this is not the way to treat a friendly country. <laughs> and I said, we are friends today, but we weren't friends in 2021. So that did not push through. So one of my proposals, again, nobody listens to Ambeto Campo, I said, why don't we rename the Lapu-Lapu and call it the Magellan? so that we can make him escabeche and fried and sinigang. But nobody listens. So it's still a Lapu-Lapu, but in Lapu-Lapu City, it is illegal to call it a Lapu-Lapu. It is a grouper. No, that's the official name. Now, yeah, our text of what happened in the Battle of Mactan comes from Antonio Picafetta, the chronicler of the Magellan Expedition. Juan Luna, the painter, in 1890, and this is in the National Museum, made a series of paintings of Magellan. And uh, he wanted to do a battle, but he was a bit troubled. So he wrote to Jose Rizal in 1890, and he said, I don't know what to call my painting. Will I call it the death of Magellan or the victory of Lapu-Lapu? And he says, if I call it the death of Magellan, people know in Europe know, so they'll buy the painting. If I call it victory of Lapu-Lapu, no one will buy my painting. So what do you think I should call it? And it is very unfortunate that we do not know what Rizal's reply was. But what we know here and what is interesting is that as early as 1890, the Filipinos were already rethinking the story of Magellan and Lapu-Lapu and thinking of how they should be remembered. I first went to Mactan when I was a boy in 1974. I was very black. No? And, and 30 years later, when I was six months pregnant, I went there. <laughs> and uh, I, when I went there, I realized that in the, in the monument, in the Mactan shrine, there are not only, there's not only one, there are actually two historical markers. Lapu-Lapu is in front, but when you look in the back, there's Ferdinand Magellan. So what you see here is the change in viewpoint. The first one, the long one, which is now hidden in the back, was issued in 1941 
shortly before the Japanese occupation. And it talks about Ferdinand Magellan dying in Mactan. And it talks about the first circumnavigation of the world. The second marker, which was installed in 1957, says that, again, Lapu-Lapu repulsed the invaders killing Magellan, and he is the first Filipino to repel European aggression. There was no Filipino in 1521. But the point here, what you can see here, is a change in thinking. In 1941, the Philippines was an American colony. In 1957, the Philippines was a free and independent country. And that's why it shows you how this has changed. In 2019, we had a film which has not been shown because of stupid social media. Uh, the, the original Spanish title is called Elcano and Magallanes, the Primera Vuelta, the first circumnavigation. In the English, it's Elcano Magellan. The big mistake was they put in Lapu-Lapu here with the Philippines' very own hero, Lapu-Lapu. But when people saw the film, or the rashes of the film, Lapu-Lapu is the bad guy. So in social media, people started to complain about a film that they didn't even see. And we even had some very smart people in Congress and in government who actually even considered banning or cutting the film because they felt it was not good for the Philippines. Now, the funny part here is it's a Spanish film. So they'll talk about Magellan and Lapu-Lapu. So if we want to, why don't we make a Lapu-Lapu film? No? But when you look at it, I'm sure it doesn't come out very, very clearly. But if you will look at the IMDB data, you will actually see how things are. When it was released and the different titles. I'm sorry, it's not very clear. But you will actually see here that in the Basque country, the title is Elcano. In Portugal, the title is Navigation. There's no Magellan because they don't, like, they don't like Magellan. And then in the Spanish, it is Magellan and then Elcano, or sometimes just Elcano. So it shows you the same film, depending on which viewpoint will either have Elcano or Magellan. Now, to end, in 2019, these are the five historians who went to the great monument of the Portuguese discoveries. Magellan is somewhere here. After we were photographed for a Portuguese newspaper, everyone went, I'm the only one who's crazy and curious. So I looked and I saw that there was a map of the world. And when I looked at the map of the world, I said, the Philippines is clearly there. But when you look, Palau, Molucas, Timor, Malacca, why is there no Philippines there? Because it's not Portuguese. It's, it's Spanish. So they did not mark it. And then when we gave the talk in the Geographic Society of Lisbon, they, this, this giant map of the map of the Portuguese discoveries, when you close the lights, the map will show you the route. And then it says here, Fernando de Magal uh, Ferdinand Magellan, and the route only goes to Mactan, and then it stops there. Because that is where the Portuguese stop. When Elcano takes over and brings it home, it's not part of the story anymore. So again, you see from the maps and from the way in which we see us how we should remember the past. So March 16, 1521, according to Yoyoy Villame, is the day when Magellan discovered the Philippines. That's in all our textbooks. In the 1970s, Gregorio Saide said, let's change our textbooks from a Filipino viewpoint and call it Magellan rediscovered the Philippines because there were people already there. But the late Chodoro Agoncillo used to say that Saide is an idiot, don't believe him. And I said, why? And then he says, what does he mean to rediscover? Does that mean that the islands went underwater and came out again? to be rediscovered. He says, no, get rid of that. Now, my point here is, can we actually say, as my students say, that the islands discovered Magellan? He did not even know where he was. So the islands discovered him. But again, today, and this is the nice thing about the Quincentennial 
celebration, we are not talking of discovery anymore. When I write the Philippine history textbook, I will not write that Magellan discovered the Philippines. I will not write that he rediscovered the Philippines. I will simply say that Magellan arrived in the Philippines in 1521. And when you look at that, it's one verb. Discovered, rediscovered, arrived. It is one word. The story does not change. Magellan and Lapu-Lapu is there. The date is still the same. But one word will change the way in which you will understand the story and one way in which you will understand yourself. So to end, we have a number of questions we will ask. Will we use history to unite rather than divide? And we know the answer. We also ask ourselves, do we remain imprisoned in the past or do we liberate ourselves from history? And again, there we know the answer. So again, because Rizal is my favorite hero and my area of expertise, I will leave you with the quotation that I think frames all of Philippine history. And it is not ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan, di makararating sa paroroonan. That's fake. That's fake news. Rizal never said that. What Rizal actually said, and I think this is what should guide us in this whole quincentennial idea, he says, I enter the future with the memory of the past. Meaning, it is the past that will tell you where you came from, where you are, and where you will go. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Ambeto Campo. Wow. <laughs> the lecture actually summarized, every, summarized the endeavors, the efforts of the National Cross Centennial Committee since 2018. So, and just to inform you, inform you uh, we reached 2,700 online viewers. <laughs> Thank you to the radio television Malacanang and to the participating government agencies. Yeah. So most of the most of our viewers are teachers from the Department of Education. And uh, uh, may I also recognize uh, some of our viewers online. Um, the Philippine ambassador uh, to Portugal, Celia Ana Feria, is watching, and also the chief arch, the chief archivist of the uh, Archivo General de Indias, Antonio Sanchez de Mora, is uh, 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 watching also. And I received a text message from uh, from Consul General of Portugal in Manila, Antonio Rufino. He is also watching. So. Um, may I now open the floor for any questions, clarifications, and some remarks about the lecture of Professor Ocampo? Okay. Uh, a summarized, uh, this is the long lecture. There's a 20-minute version that's available online. Uh, if you look up the Ateneo Arete, uh, it's called uh, How to Liberate Ourselves from the Past. So it's a summary of this in 20 minutes. No? So this one has all the funny parts. Uh, that is the condensed version. So YouTube, Ateneo Arete, and then you just type out my name. And the, con the concise version will come out. Okay. Oh, yes, I'm Embajador. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very interesting, as always, with Dr. Campo, Professor Campo. But my question is, taking advantage that you're here in Guyan, in Eastern Samar, just the day before um, will be the 500 years, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you read and what is your impression as a historian of the first touch between the Spanish expedition led by Magellan, but I mean, the expedition was, was much more than Magellan, 
um, the first touch that happened in these very islands, if I'm not wrong, in Hamahon, um, of these two worlds, in this encounter of first touch? Uh, actually, the, the thing is also not new. Uh, in 1992, when uh, they were supposed to celebrate the discovery of America, um, they agreed that it would not be about discovery, and they called 1992 the Encuentro de Dos Mundos, the encounter of two worlds. And I'd like to think that when Magellan sailed into our, our waters, it was also an encounter of two worlds. But as you can see, um, the people here were used to visitors, which was why they were hospitable. I'd like to think, unfortunately, people of Guam will not be too happy, but for me, I think there was just a, that's why they were called Isla de los Ladrones, the, the Isle of Thieves. I think they were not really thieves. It was just, um, there was something lost in translation. I think the people of Guam just took what they wanted because they felt it's barter. This is fair exchange for what we gave you, but in terms of what Magellan saw, it was theft. So again, it's, the encounter was not very good, but when he came here, he was received very well, and after traveling through the Pacific, they were not in very good shape, but it was here that they were revived, here that they were given provisions, and Colombo even accompanied them to Cebu and introduced them to uh, Umabon. So again, there are two sides of that coin, and that, I think that is why the quincentennial, that's why you have victory and humanity, because there are two sides of the same coin. A few weeks later, Magellan will be dead, but that was, his, that was his mistake again. But if he had maintained friendly relations, then things would have changed much differently. But it shows you again that hospitality that the Philippines are famous for from the beginning all the way till today. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor first and then Javier. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Ocampo, for that very informative uh, presentation or lecture. I would like to ask, why did it take 500 years before Humunhon is recognized? I mean, I'd been asking, since I became the mayor in 2004, <laughs> I'd been asking that uh, Magellan in our textbooks Magellan discovered the Philippines. You know, uh, we played an important role in the discovery of the Philippines. But why is it that up to now there is nothing in Humunhon? Wala pong nagbibigay ng recognition. Why did it take 500 years? And I'm so happy that this happened after 500 yeah. years. Actually, it's Thank not, you, Ambassador, yeah. for coming. It's not just 500 years because before the war, I, I first heard of Mahamunhon when I was in college. I read a pre-war article by the great anthropologist E. Arsenio Manuel, who became my friend. Uh, and he wrote about the Homonhon rock. So as early as even before the war, they were already looking up, uh, digging up to, to, to make the, the story of the Magellan voyage more complete, more enhanced. But again, as you know, history textbooks have to be simplified and they only pick uh, what they think they can put, in, I mean, we cannot put the whole story of the Magellan expedition in one module. So uh, it is the unfortunate uh, thing that Philippine history, as it is taught, has to be oversimplified. And that's why not only Homonhon, but many other places in the route, which is why when you look at that new NQC map with the 34 markers, it's giving... Uh, due recognition to things which have been, and I'm, yeah, it, you're right, it's taken more than 500 years uh, to get this recognition done. But again, better late than never. And I hope that by building on this, we can find more things and probably add to the 34. But it is again the, you know, I, I unveiled so many markers in my nine years as chair of the Historical Commission, I always wondered, one, I hated it that it was always written in Filipino, because in places like Samar, it should be written in Samar. Uh, and, some, and when I came in, the markers were so long. I said, even if I'm chair of the commission, I will not read this text. So it, 
had to be shorter, nicer. In some places, we even put an English marker. Uh, but again, it's that. Uh, we mark a place, but from my experience, sometimes when you mark the place, people actually forget. So it is the challenge of the people who receive the mark. I mean, when you, the chairman of the historical commission will sign a document entrusting the marker to you. And so Manila, the national government has given it to you. It is up to you and the people who received it that will keep that memory alive. So it's two ways. Yes, Javier. Okay, well, thank you. Well, congratulations for the talk. I think we have, we agree that we have a great historian, but maybe we have lost a great comedian <laughs> because you always make us laugh a lot. Um, well, I mean, more than a question to you is a sort of reflection. I really was wondering when I was starting to study this episode of the history, the first touch, as the ambassador says, and I said, why they uh, skip Suluan? the expedition, and they went to Homohon. Suluan was the first and Homohon was later. But, but they went to Homohon. But on the other hand, when I saw the map, I, I, I realized Suluan was populated, but Homohon, much bigger, was nobody living there, no? And so I, I got some explanation a few days ago about, uh, uh, well, by, by uh, our friend Ian Alfonso, it was a, a lecture talking about some, uh, well, Homohon somehow was considered a sacred land no? by the people there. And then it came to me, and that's, that's the, what I want to, to launch, how oral tradition can help a lot to reconstruct parts of the history or to make us understand history. No? So, and I think that here in Giwan should be uh, legends or stories or whatever um, that maybe can relate it to this history. No, I don't know if you have collected this, this history or is some research on this oral tradition, but actually it goes about the importance of oral tradition as a source, as a source of history, because so far we have gone through maps, we have gone through chronicles, uh, archives, etc., etc., but not that much, I think. Eh? I'm, I've been aficionado. Uh, not too much about oral tradition, and I suppose that there would be a lot of, of stories, legends here in Cebu, in Palawan, all the places where the expedition went through. What, what do you think about, about Yeah, that? It's, a, it's a good idea, and I get, we have the Borinagas here who have done great research on this area. Uh, I first knew them because they wrote about Balangiga, now they're doing the Magellan Expedition. So it's going beyond, I mean, how many times can we go through Picafeta? That will not change very much, but it's also the way in which that history is remembered and that history is understood. My colleagues in the profession will probably be irritated because it, sometimes it goes against the historical record, but history is a living thing. Um, it only gains its power when it is relevant to people in a present time. Without its relevance, it is nothing. It's just the past. So it's part of, uh, we're interdisciplinary now, and I think this makes uh, us more, uh, how would you say this? We, we want to put all things in. No? I mean, archeology, span anthropology, before there used to be very separate, but now we are mixing all in order to find a fuller, more complete version of the past. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, you mentioned a while ago um, about history having um, a lot of versions. Um, knowing that or hearing that, um, I want to ask which of the versions should we remember without being divisive or... Well, uh, as a historian, we all go back to the, what we call the primary sources. So we read Antonio Picafeta. So like in my undergrad history class, they, they're required to read the Philippine part because you don't have to read about Patagonia and you know, the other places, but we read the Philippine part. And my students actually, when they read about the Battle of Mactan, and 
it, it, for them, it opens their eyes because then they realize it's not what we think it is. It's like comics, you know, Mag Lapu Lapu is killing Magellan. When you read the text, it's 49 men against 1,500. So they were bound to lose, but that's not the way. So for many of my students, being able to see the text makes them change the way in which they understand history. Then I often tell people that I learn more from my students than they learn from me. There was one student that raised her hand one day and said, sir, do you think Picafetta was gay? the chronicler of the Magellan expedition. And many of my colleagues will probably say, that's an irrelevant question, Sh shut up, sit down. But I asked her, why did you ask that question? Then she said, you know, look at this, the Rajas that they met. The description of the Raja was he had beautiful, black, shiny hair, he was muscled, etc. And the description of the man was one paragraph. And the description of the woman was two sentences showing she was she, ha she was topless and she wore a grass skirt. So she said, do you think Picafeta is gay? So I said, no, can we read the text again? So I told her, read the text. So she read the text. The description of the man, beautiful, bodied, bronze co brown colored, shiny. But what you, when you read the text, in the head he was describing, Picafeta was describing the gold earrings. Then it goes down, describes the neck. He describes the gold necklace. It goes down to his side, describes his sword with a gold hubbard, his, his armlets, his rings, his leglets, his, the gold. So he was like a Christmas tree. So when we looked at that, we realized it was not sexual. He was actually describing the gold. And so when they came here, they, they actually, you know, and they would give sort of, when you look at the gifts they brought, little caps, bells, knife, and then the people in the Philippines will give them gold things. So it was barter. So when you see that, you see what attracted them to the area. You know, so um, Picafeta says, there's so much gold here, you just kick the sand and gold as big as walnuts will come out. You know that you cannot kick the sand and get gold. My theory is when they walked around, it was a grave because the pabaon was, our dead were buried with jewelry. So they started to excavate. And I think that was also part of the problems in, in Cebu, you know, uh, when they started to get for gold. But again, that's overreading into it. But it shows you that even the text that we know very much can be read and understood in different ways, in different times. Yeah, are, well, you're guided by what the historical text says, but it sometimes helps us understand by reading and rereading text from a different viewpoint. So the lecture was all about viewpoint and why it is the way that it is. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Ambe Tocampo. So, masayang makipagkwentuhan, pero limitado na po ang oras natin. Ano? So, yeah. Okay, okay, that's, ano po, that's, that's a good uh, ano po, idea. You can email Sir Ambet or follow, follow his Facebook page. You know? Yes. And may I call on uh, Mayor Annalisa Kwan and uh, Ms. Ayesha Saiseng rep to represent the National Cool Centennial Committee and to award the Certificate of Recognition and present a token of appreciation to, to our lecturer. Uh, the, the National Quincentennial Committee and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines award this certificate of recognition to Dr. Ambet Arrocampo for his valuable contribution as resource speaker in the sixth Quincentennial Lecture Series entitled Magellan, Maps, and Birth of Nation, held on March 15, 2021 at Calicoan Villa, Giwan, Eastern Samar. The National Quincentennial Committee was created through Executive Order No. 55, Series of 2018, to prepare the country in celebrating the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan, the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation in the world, and other related events, given this 15th day of March 2021, signed Dr. Rene R. Escalante, Executive Director, National Quincentennial Committee, and Chairperson 
National Historical Commission of the Philippines. This program is in partnership with the Presidential Communications Operations Office and the Radio Television Malacanang. Professor Ocampo was presented with the maquette, you know, the miniature historical marker of the 34 sites identified by the Historical Commission as part of the first circumnavigation of the world. Okay. Thank you very much, Mayor Kwan and Ms. Sai Seng. This concludes the sixth lecture, Quincentennial Lecture Series, and thank you very much for attending. Hope to see you again, and stay tuned for the updates on the official Facebook page. <laughs>